Hey, everybody, and welcome to Virtual TrekCon with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. We are joined by the most special of special guests, quite possibly the most special guest anybody could ever have, Mr. Rod Roddenberry. How are you? I'm, I'm doing great. That's one, one hell of an intro, and you've buttered <laughs> me up pretty good, so I'll answer any questions at this point. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we just, first of all, just want to say hello, check in on you, make sure you're doing well. The air quality has been pretty poor lately and we've had a lockdown. How is everything? Your spirits are high. Your health is good. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I, I really can't complain. Yeah, the air quality did suck. In fact, I'm in my car right now because I have driven to San Diego today to get the hell out of Dodge. Um, <laughs> just, just, it's just to get out of LA and I've got to just rent in a place down here and granted, the air doesn't look that much better right now, but it's near the ocean, so I'm going to enjoy that. <laughs> you look good, man. It's been it's been a while since I saw you last. Actually, I yeah. don't even remember when the last time I saw you. It might have been one of the uh, events. Uh, I think you were giving a great speech, uplifting oh, people. You're always you're always there to like pick people up and and be supportive. That's uh, kind of you to say. And then I'm at the bar drinking with all those same people. <laughs> well, that's how you pick them up. <laughs> that's how, exactly. <laughs> what, what better way to support somebody than to have a glass of something with them? Exactly. Um, but yeah, man, I, I feel like a real kinship to you, Rod. Um, I remember seeing you growing up on the set, uh, walking down the aisleways of Paramount, and I just felt like, there's somebody that's my age. There's somebody that kind of gets it. You know, it's funny. You and Will, uh, two guys that I met early on when I was young, were, were in the same bracket age area. And then Will and I were like, oh, good, another kid. And then we never hung out. And then you were there and like, oh, good, another kid. And then we never hung out. <laughs> so I don't know. I feel like an asshole. I, oh, I don't know if I can say that on there. But I feel like a jerk. I, I didn't intentionally not hang out. I just did my own thing. So as you were busy doing yours, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, but I, I just felt like, oh, there's somebody that's my age. I mean, there was nobody really, yeah. there were, everybody was adults on the set there. So just yeah. to see somebody that was my age, I was like, I got to get to know that guy. And I always wish that I could spend more time hanging out with you. But, you know, obviously it didn't happen as much as we wanted it to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got to tell you, though, so... So I, I had never watched a uh, little bit of fanboy in me. I had never really watched Deep Space Nine all the way through. I've what? now just started season. I know, I know. I, <laughs> listen, I saw, it's funny, years ago, so I, I plugged into season five and caught season five. And then I never went back. And then, listen, I just did my own thing. But for, for one of the shows we do, we've been watching all the Star Trek. So we're on fifth season of Deep Space Nine. And, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, well. I'm what twenty plus years too late, but uh, I'm starting to enjoy the show. And Sirach, you're you're freaking amazing. You you absolutely are. And I have a million questions for you on, like, what it is to be a kid. Listen, people have already asked you this, and this isn't my show, so I'm still gonna ask. We welcome these questions because doesn't Deep Space <laughs> yeah. Nine age so well? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And and to be a kid on set, like I, I I'm kind of curious I, I just i don't give me the quick answer because you've answered this for so many people already uh will has explained his side and not only that to be a kid on set who's forced to wear terrible sweaters <laughs> terrible sweater patterns i mean yeah but those sweaters from that alone those sweaters yeah. also aged well yeah well, <laughs> yeah now <laughs> i don't know about that part but uh, you know what? It was, it was it was the most fun I've ever had in my life, actually, even though, you know, I was alone and there wasn't that many kids around and it was kind yeah. of an unusual environment. Just it was just the most fun. I just felt like I was doing something productive. I felt like I was part of something big. And, you know, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was just it was that special to me. That's awesome. Yeah. And the, and the documentary, uh, What We Leave Behind, was fantastic, too. I, I it was a nice I think so. behind the scenes glimpse at, at, at what that family was like. Anyhow, sorry. But I, I would actually flip that question and kind of pose it back yeah. to you because I'm, you're growing up in this, these, these Star Trek, right? And uh, what, what was it like? I mean, were you watching? Were you aware of any of the shows? When I had met you up to the point that I had met you, 
Were you watching Next Generation? Were you watching the original series? Uh, what was your your background up until that point? Yeah, it's um, so so. I never really watched the original series when I was much younger. I would see episodes, and I remember like the first thing of Star Trek that I ever remember was being I don't know six, seven, eight years old in my father's home office bathroom floor and he had a reel-to-reel projector i don't know if it's eight millimeter or whatever it was and he would show bloopers at conventions well he put the blooper reel on for me and 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 projected it against like this white cardboard thing Mm -hmm. and i would just sit on the floor and giggle because bloopers you know one the door doesn't close and some guy runs into it or they fall down the stairs or or whatever you know those bloopers were classic and so that was almost like my introduction to star trek Um, then jumping ahead, uh, being a 13 year old working as a PA on next generation, my father would bring home the, the cuts every, I think Thursday, and I would watch them on VHS. And I became a legitimate real fan of the next generation because that's, that's what I first saw. And I would watch that every Thursday. And so I, I, I love the show. I wouldn't say that I got it like a lot of people do. I mean, the. I was still too young and doing my own thing. Um, and then, I, I mean, I just became proud of Star Trek. I just became proud of the messaging after my father left and fans would come up to me and say, Star Trek had this positive impact on my life and inspired me. You guys have heard these stories. And, and, and on some level, maybe everyone listening to the show and preaching to the choir. But uh, Star Trek is different, man. I mean, all of them. Star Trek is different because it speaks to people. Um, other yeah. shows do, but it gives us hope. Uh, so uh, again, preaching to the choir, but um, I, I absolutely love it. And proud. Yeah, it gives it gives us hope, and it lets us see versions of ourselves. Everybody kinds of has a a place, you know, um, from different sexualities to different race, different you know gender. Yeah. So there's so much out there. Um, but I, you know, for me, growing up, I was uh, on on set at the uh, on school at school on the set. Right. Right. And so I had a little bit unusual kind of education in, during that time. Uh, but when I would go back to regular school, I would sometimes get teased about my affiliation with Star Trek because, you know, right. the nerd show and the nerd thing and that. Yep. Um, did you ever experience any of that? You know, I definitely saw that uh, for sure. And it's been interesting. I'm, I'm 46 years old. So over the, my, my plus four decade life, um, that, that, that concept of geek and nerds and, and dorks, which I resisted. I was never one. I didn't do well in school. I wasn't a jock either, but I tried to be cool. I listened to my heavy metal and long hair. And so I I had my own little bubble, stupid world. Um, But I was also friends with the geeks and nerds. And one of my longtime friends today was the stereotypical geek nerd. Uh, But it's been interesting to go to whether it was Comic-Con, Vegas, all these things and see that shift, right? We see see these geeks and dorks, allegedly, it becomes, I don't want to say socially acceptable, watching sci-fi, being a geek, being a dork is cool now. Yeah, You know, cool you've now. got, you've got everyone watching it. You've got, mm-hmm. you know, the geeks and dorks, but you've also got the jocks and the Harley riders and the, and the hot women and the, and all women. Sorry, I don't mean to just say hot women, but <laughs> all women. Um, it's just, it's shifted to more of a normalcy now to, to watch this stuff and to be, it's, I think it's cool to be a geek. Absolutely. Yeah, especially now because you have all the tech companies that have now taken over industry. And so yeah. all the geeks and nerds that we knew growing up are like Google execs and you it's know, they're funny. all they're all big people. They're like players in the game now. So it's like it has been popularized, it has been normalized. It it's now the, the stigma has been taken away and it's now something cool to be kind of nerd or a geek. Yeah, and, and and the concept of geek, right? You can be a geek or nerd and everything. You could be a muscle car grease monkey geek. Right. They've got mm-hmm. those shows on TV where they, they chop hot rods and do custom stuff. That's a geek. Mm-hmm. I mean, he might roll up his sleeve and, 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 and turn a wrench, but he is a geek. You know, anyone who rides Harleys, they are geeks about Harleys. So it's become sort of uh, normalized. That's right. Ciroc and I are sports geeks. That's yeah. all we talk about before and after recording and sometimes accidentally during recording when we're supposed to be talking about Star Trek. But uh, Rod, I want to take it back real quick to Deep Space Nine for a moment, if that's okay, because sure. I was really interested 
in the fact that you said that you've kind of gone back as an adult and watched Deep Space Nine. And I was wondering what your impressions are of that show, seeing them through the eyes of, a, of an adult, being that you, you watched it somewhat back in the day, but now that you're sure. looking at it, what are your impressions of it? So when I watched it, so I had never watched Deep Space Nine all the way through. I caught mm -hmm. season five for some reason when I was much younger. And I, I was drawn to the action and I enjoyed the show. But this, that, at that young age, I also liked Next Generation and Star Wars. And, and I, I kind of, I want to say I liked them surface. I didn't necessarily pick up on the minutiae or the, the details of the messaging. You know, it didn't speak to me as a young adult. Um, as an adult, and I won't bring maturity into this because I'm probably not that mature, but maybe more <laughs> than when I was 12, um, I obviously see through see more now and and i'm able to pick up on more and uh watching uh deep space nine from the beginning to now season five which i haven't finished it yet um i've i've really enjoyed for me deep space nine the difference there character uh not that next generation didn't have character but there is tremendous growth in character and relationships again preaching to the choir here um it's been really fascinating to see these characters grow evolve and have and form friendships and and romance and and i mean Tarak, you and aaron were were phenomenal uh you've been phenomenal through this whole experience and i know i've got some really interesting things coming up with aaron's character uh, uh but I, I i love seeing that you guys started as little kids at least on the show concept and now we're at a point where you guys are young adults and you're dealing with real issues you know, it's not just, uh, I don't know what episode it was or how many it was, Sirach, where you're trying to meet a girl. Um, you guys are dealing with serious stuff now, uh, which, which is uh, great that they've given your characters real roles instead of kid roles. So um, yeah. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Yeah, rest in peace, Aaron Eisenberg. This is, this is a shout there out to him. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's with us. Um, yeah. But yes, and it, and it, it actually showed a, uh, interspecies relationship. We talk about interracial and uh, you know different sexual relationship, but this was like an interspecies relationship that uh, two people were able to grow together. Um, yeah. But but you know I wanted to ask you. So you're surrounded. You're in the Star Trek. You, you know you grow up in it. Was there a part of you that said I want to do something different and and kind of rejected it for a while during your evolution and growth and say you know I kind of wanted trying my hand at different things. I, I want to not be about Star Trek right now. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. It, like it, my, my entire teenage and probably part of my 20s, I trying to figure out who I was. And I won't even say I figured that out yet. Um, yeah, I didn't. My parents pushed me. You know, actually, I, I did a number of commercials when I was a kid. Kingsford Charcoal, Granilla Clusters, Crystal Foods, Max Steel's Robot Force. One to grow on. If anyone ever finds video of this stuff, one to grow on. Yeah, I, I kind of want I to get that. it, but then I want to hide it from everyone. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I was not cut out for acting. <laughs> Anyhow, so sorry, sorry. Um, I did definitely reject before I really understood Star Trek. Before my father passed away, they pushed me into these things, and I just rejected it because I was a teenager. You know, they wanted me to be in the industry, and I did not. And I did not want to be like my father or anything like that. Then after my father passed away and I did the documentary Trek Nation during that, I learned a great deal about my father. I, I, I came to the conclusion I still didn't want to be my father because those are huge shoes to fill. I mean, no one should want that. But for me, it was just taking the next steps because I, 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 I really truly loved and appreciated what Star Trek meant to people and the messaging behind it. And that's what I decided I wanted to make my life about. And it's going to my, my own small way. I am not personally creating the next Star Trek. I, I'm, I'm not necessarily creating any TV that is that inspirational right now. Um, but in my own way, we've got a family foundation. We're carrying on that messaging the best that we can. And mm -hmm. Star Trek has always inspired. And I want the Roddenberry name to always be synonymous with inspiring people. So, Sirac, so you had a similar uh, life path, I think, which is why you're so interested in, in that specific question in that. In your youth, you know, you were part of Star Trek, and then you kind of wanted to branch out and see what else you can do and spread your wings and, and define yourself as an adult. And it's kind of recently, you, you've come back to it and, and 
and have really been able to appreciate Star Trek for what it is through the eyes of an adult, right? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, part of me was kind of like, I want to get away from it. I want to get away from, you know, the stereotype or being pigeonholed into something. And so, yeah, I wanted to explore and, and expand and try something new. Um, but, you know, I, I wanted to pivot from that back to uh, Rod. Um, you know, Avery playing the Captain Cisco. you know, I got to share it. I got to get to know him, build a relationship. But because of that, because of him making sacrifices, being away from his family, his family got less of him. So while, while he, he's being shared with the rest of the world, his own family is not sharing in that. And I, I feel like to some extent, maybe you experienced that with your father because your father was like so important to the rest of the world and to all of these people. And maybe, you know, some of that time was taken away from his family time and the time that he could have been spending with you as well. Well, I, it's really interesting you say that. And, and it's very um, uh, humble and astute of you to sort of see very mature of you because I didn't really realize it until much later in life that sort of idea but just for you to say what you said about Avery and have that sort of uh sympathy empathy for his family is is incredible um yeah so so you know Star Trek was a second family for my father uh when my father went to Paramount and they started doing Next Generation um it was you could almost see the instant I was 13 I was just learning how to stand up for myself in a way and starting to defy my father like a, a young teenager does. And he became less and less, you know, apparent at home. So you, you could definitely see the, the classic psychology of, of fathers now away and sons trying to anyhow. So I was rebellious. We, we fought a lot and I was an angry teenager and, and all this sort of stuff. He, he wasn't, non-existent we just didn't connect as father and son there was a huge uh, generation gap my father had me when he was 52 years old and so i feel like regardless of star trek or or a, or a job that kept him away um it, we just didn't connect uh so a lot of people had parents that went to work every day and they saw him in the evening to give my father credit he did come home, or at least I recall my father coming home almost every night and us having dinner as a family. So yes and no to your question. Definitely, he had a second family. Definitely, he, he, his attention and love went to a number of the people there. Um, but he still had enough to come home and, and was there as well. So by no means did I have a rough life. But yeah, he had, he had two families for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it was interesting talking to Will Wheaton. He kind of had, he looked up to my father because, you know, they got to interact more. And Will told me stories when I interviewed him for my documentary. And, you know, I had these feelings of like jealousy because they would have conversations about things and my father would support him and stand up for him on things. And I was like, oh, but that's, but that's my dad, you know, it, like this. Mm -hmm sort of response so uh, there was there was a little bit of jealousy but but I've, I've certainly come to terms with that yeah a lot of growth a lot of uh i mean that's what happens with maturity and just time in general we just see things differently um and you know as we get older we start to understand the kind of tough decisions that our parents had to make yeah yeah and, and i'll tell you what I, i've got a seven-year-old right now and and this is not an insult or a dig at my father it did give me a way to reflect on oh, I want to be there for him more than my father was. Again, not that I was left alone, not that I had a terrible childhood, but it gave me this sort of like, I don't want to do that. I want to be there, you know? So it's, it was, it's, we all learn. Yeah, you know, and, and I'm so proud of you and the, and the growth that you've made and, and in what you're doing today by, I mean, you're, you're now producing shows and you're basically, uh, you know, stepping into that role as, as the guy who's, you know, making Star Trek shows. And, and that's just seems natural now. There are many people making Star Trek. Um, and I am one of the many, if you ever see the executive uh, producer <laughs> credits, not yeah. just on Star Trek, but many shows these days. We used to count eight, them. Nine, 10 of them. Yeah. Right. 
Uh, and, and, and as you guys know, an executive producer can be anyone from someone who's on set every day, going through every script, every revision, who's in it and, and, and contributing to someone who's more on the second tier, I would say, and is contributing and sending in notes. But certainly, I, it's an amazing team. I can't take credit for being the mind behind the show. That's, that's Alex Kurtzman, Secret Hideout, and all the writers who do that. Um, very proud to be a part of it and trying to do my part in it. But uh, uh, I, I, I never want to mislead anyone thinking like, oh, I'm the guy doing Star Trek now. <laughs> right. But you know that having your name attached does give us sure. all, all of us Star Trek fans, it gives us this sense and this feeling of ease, of happiness, of joy, that this is all still uh, you know, in the family, in the Star Trek family, and it kind of has your your stamp of approval. And there's something else that you do uh, with regards to that. And we talk about Star Trek Las Vegas all the time. We talk about yeah. these Star Trek conventions. And I can't tell you how much as a fan it means to us to see you roaming the halls, smiling, giving some, just being there makes us feel like, okay, it's a real Star Trek convention now. It's not just right. a thing that some people are putting on. Rod's here. It just it just adds to the officialness of it, and we really appreciate it. We love your your positivity when you show up. We love the inclusiveness. How you seem genuinely happy to yes. see everyone. It's this amazing feeling. I just kind of wanted to ask you, like, when you do go to these conventions. Is there a certain mindset you have? Are you going there to spread the joy? Are you going there because it gives you joy? What, mm -hmm. What's what's the feeling behind all that? Well, absolutely the last one there. I have fun. I mean, I really have fun. And you know, I do love talking about the Star Trek philosophy. I'm not mm -hmm. the guy to get into the minutia of episodes and start talking about when the character did this and that. I love the bigger ideas. I love the philosophy. I love the inspiration. Um, so, so my stage time, uh, I try to dedicate to that. Sometimes it's something else, but um, I, I love it. And I love, I mean, it doesn't have to be at the bar, but I love sitting down and talking to people. But at the end of the day, when we used to go to Quark's and, and yeah. now we go to the, uh, what do they call it? The Rio? Um, the Masquerade. Whatever that place, Masquerade. Masquerade bar. And just, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm friends with everyone. I'm also not a huge celebrity. Sure, I have the Roddenberry name, and at a Star Trek convention, that is more significant than outside of. Um, but, Sirach, you walk down a hallway and people are running up to you um, because you are a face. People love seeing you. You're, you're an actor. Um, I walk down the hallway, and just because I've been going for years, people talk to me, but I don't get swarmed by people. I have the best of, all, of both worlds, and I'm not necessarily bragging. I guess I am a little bit. <laughs> I, it, it never gets too much for me. Whereas Ciroc, maybe you just, you just want some time. You just, you don't want to be bothered right now because you're, you're doing some, whatever. And you've always got people coming at you. For me, I walk down the hallway, people recognize me and give a little nod, whatever. So, so it's, it's, it's great. I'm, I mean, I love being there truly. Yeah. That's one thing that definitely comes across is uh, how down to earth you are. I feel like you, you'll, You'll relate to people, um, and sometimes we we envision you know people on this pedestal on this high level and say, oh, that's that's you know whisper his name, that's Eugene over there. But with you, I feel like you're walking up like, hey, what's up, guys? Uh, and there's no pretentious, there's no you know, you're very I'm sweet. somebody. It's like, what because, are you guys whispering about? I've never, been yeah, yeah. I've never been in that position. I've never had to run away and hide because I'm not a big celebrity. So it's, it's, that's, it's the best of both worlds. Like I can be myself. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about something else on a side note. And that is your love for scuba diving. <laughs> Where did that come from? Like why scuba dive? That's like not a, a usual thing that people pick. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you the quick version of the story and I don't even know how entertaining it is, but it is to me. Um, when I was 16, I got my driver's license and I, I was just so excited to, to be an adult and do things on my own. I had heard two people, two adults talking about scuba diving and I love the water. 
And I was like, I'm going to go do that. So like one of the first things I did when I got my driver's license, I enrolled in a night course um, to, to get my NAWI certification, my open water one. And um, I, I did the class. It sounds stupid to say it now, but I did that on my own. I passed the test with a 94 where at that time at school, I was getting C's and D's and the occasional B. So I was so proud of myself. And then I had to do my checkout dive. And my mother, instead of going that weekend, my mother forced me to go to a like SAT prep thing or something like that. And I was so pissed and never did it. But then a few years later, I went to college, did the course again, passed and got my certification. I just fell in love with the ocean. I mean, mm. it, it is, it is, I've had every experience underwater that you can possibly have in terms of, of emotion. Um, granted, fear is not a big one, but sure it's happened. But exhilaration, excitement, I mean, the beauty, the most surreal images i still have the the most beautiful moments in my life are still etched into my mind because they were underwater i could see the rays coming through the seaweed and then i come through the seaweed to this beautiful patch of just round sand and it's like a ballroom and you could see the kelp just going side to side and the sun's coming it's like these magical moments and I, i've got a number of those in terms of scuba diving and it's my, I'm, I'm not spiritual, but it's my place of Zen. Mm. You know, I, I just, I, I center, I guess. Uh, teach their own, of course. I think everyone has their place of passion and when they're in the zone, um, that's just mine. You like the solitude, the, the quietness of it? I mean, is it, is it those things? You know, uh, y yes. I, I think what it is, 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 I don't, every day I'm, I'm, I'm so busy and I'm not busy because I'm important doing important things. I have a mind that's just static and every now and then something comes through that makes sense. Um, it's almost, you know, I don't want to say I'm ADD, but I'm sure I am there. You're it's, you're there on the, you're focused on the moment. You've got this equipment that's, that's saving your life. You have to rely on it and you're, you're a fish out of water or a human in an ocean and it's just a it's just you have to be present and this is some of the few times that i'm present mm -hmm. so i think that's what it is wow cool so for me yeah rod you're such a good storyteller you kind of got <laughs> Sorok and me like mesmerized for a second yeah. <laughs> we just yeah, i for exactly. a second i kind of glanced over Sorok and he had the same look i did we were just kind of like well, I, was in the place. I, I know me too <laughs> <laughs> we were both there with you, man. Do you ever, uh, do you dabble in a lot of writing? I know you've kind of done some things. Is that something you want to do? Or are you more? You know what? I, I, tr I tried some back when I was in Toronto working on Earth Final Conflict. Um, right. Mm -hmm. and, and never picked up like writing script. I never got the, the skills. I, I never took the time to learn how to write and how to create stories. I was just writing some fun stories and i i got my my ass handed to me a little bit not in a really bad way that was too dramatic i i, I got i got some i wasn't even feedback but i kind of got shot down pretty hard on something and kind of never went back to it so i hate to sound like such a it's like the wrong message to be saying well if if, if you fall off the horse well just walk away um <laughs> so I, I feel like that's kind of what i did but I've never had a huge passion for being a writer. Um, and I'm a little negative on the traditional industry. You know, I, I, I see enough stuff. You could be a writer and spend your life so passionate about trying to write. And then you get stuck as a staff writer on the show. And I see these people and hear them who are like, yeah, but I'm a staff writer now. I'm like, do you get to write what you want? No, I pretty much just write the stories they tell me. It's a check. I'm like, oh, okay, well. So you're not really enjoying it. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying every writer's like that. I'm sure there's plenty of writers and staff writers out there who love what they do. But I mean, it's the same with any sort of art, right? When you have to start compromising and, and doing things that someone else wants because you need to get your check, uh, do, do you lose a bit of the, 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 the charm, the, the, the feeling, the passion? I, I don't know. Yeah. And only the top 2% even make it as a staff writer to boot. Right. The other 98% right. are just going, God, I wish I could just make a living off of this stuff. Right. Uh, right. Sorok, you're going to say something? Sorry. 
Yeah, my question was, um, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot in, in discussing Star Trek with the fans is that they see themselves on Star Trek. There's somebody mm-hmm. there that they relate to and that like, you know, people say, hey, you know, Black Captain or, you know, you as a kid, I was a kid growing up. Who, is, who out of the Star Trek universe do you relate to? What a great question. Odo. Yeah. Because that's because you're not asking who's your favorite character. Um, right. Wow, yeah. that's a good one. Do I relate to? So I don't know if I relate, but um, I'm. I've always loved Captain Picard. Uh, if you said favorite character, I'd say Data for a different set of reasons. But uh, uh, Picard, because he he didn't necessarily know everything. He captained the way I think a captain or a leader should lead. He had a team of people he trusted who had a job to do. He valued their input when he needed them. He, he listened to everyone and then made an informed decision based on the information he had. He respected them and they respected him. He wasn't one of those leaders who said, you do what I say because I tell you because I'm the captain. I don't think that's the right way to lead at all uh, in, in, in anything. You know, the, the, the bosses and em- employers out there who say, don't ask questions, just do what you're told. I'm sure it depends on the kind of job, but I, uh, I, I don't, I don't subscribe to that sort of mentality. Anyhow, am I that, do I relate to him? Cause I think I'm like him. No, but I'd like to be, mm-hmm. I mean, if I, if I had to, to lead people, I would like to be that kind of leader. Yeah. How about, um, how about you guys? Who do you relate to? Sirac, if you weren't Sirac. <laughs> it would be Captain Sis- Captain Benjamin Sisko. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, because I, I like... Shave a these. goatee. Uh, yeah, I'd have to shave down a little bit, but I still have the basics. Um, no, I just like... I like his leadership style because of some of the similar things that you said. Um but I really like the man he is because he always led by example off off the screen, not just, you know, as an actor, but I've, I've never seen him be uh, impolite to people. I've never yeah. seen him um, talk, call a woman out of her name or be, you know, not respectful of, of a woman or anybody. Yeah. Um, and so those are the kinds of things like, you know, people say one thing and then they do another, but this with Avery, I felt like, he was saying and doing the right things. They matched up and it was an alignment. And um, also the degree, the level of education and the way he articulated mm-hmm. himself. Those, those are the things that, you know, I, I admired about him. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I was just thinking about his character. Um, I, it, it, it certainly did grow and evolve, but he was kind of, um, a, a, I don't say a man of few words. He spoke everything he said he didn't embellish. He said what needed to be said, never in a rude way as a captain, but he seemed to, the occasional episodes that he had a social moment was nice, but when he was leading, he was doing what needed to be done. And, and I think telling everyone and what needed to be said. And so I, I've, I've, it's been nice to sort of see his character do that. But I've also, like I said, I yeah. enjoyed the time when he smiles. <laughs> when when he's with um um uh, Cassidy? No, our our trill. Oh, oh, Dax. oh Dax. 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 Okay. Um and the, the old man comments come out and stuff right. like that. Um mm-hmm. uh and the tender moments of course that he's had with you. What's the episode it, it, where it's you as an old man played by Tony Todd. Oh, Tony Todd. Yeah. Tony Todd. The visitor, the visitor. We're His coming interactions up on that. with you and Tony Todd, and that was that was beautiful. I mean, that was absolutely beautiful. It was it was nice to see a different episode. You know, it, it was sort of the um, city on the edge of forever because you're not on the ship. You're not 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 totally on the ship. You're you're in a different place, and you get to see these characters a different way. Uh, the episodes I, I I just watched that I that, that are hard for me to swallow are the um, uh, Mirror Universe ones. Mm-hmm. I just have a problem. The, the acting's great. It's just the science and the, the rationale behind it just kind of irked me a little bit. But <laughs> I, I have that Ciroc problem on it. every show that does Mirror Universe. 
<laughs> you know, I, I want to put in a, a couple quick words about uh, Captain Picard uh, since you brought him up. He's definitely for me. He's the one that I always kind of related to or looked up to as a kid. Just mm -hmm. which is strange when you're a kid to look at a 50 year old and just say that's that's the right way to be because for me it was wasn't so much that he inspired me as much as I fully understood that this was the correct way to be. Like it seemed like he made the right decision on how to act with, you know, with regards to anything. And when he made a mistake, he acted the right way and acknowledged yeah. that mistake yeah. and he learned from it. And that's to me, the way of the perfect human being, not to be perfect, but to have the best reactions when you're faced with your own mistakes or other people's mistakes or the good and the bad. And he just seemed like, like if there were, seven billion versions of captain picard on the planet we'd be doing pretty well you know what i mean like he's mm -hmm. that kind of person uh but rod i, I agree kind of, yeah he's just he's just too good he's just amazing um <laughs> and, and, can we and, get a little bit of a uh, captain picard uh voiceover <laughs> okay how about this beverly <laughs> well done <laughs> thank you thank you well done uh, he's so a master I, but I didn't want to ask. Go ahead, Ron. No, no. And I just want to say Anson Mount is my 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 most recent number two as Pike. Nice. Because if you guys saw the first episode of season <clears throat> two of Discovery, the way he comes onto the bridge and introduces himself, uh, perfect captain. Yeah. He brings he, he he his details up on the board. He shows his flaws. He says, "I'm not like your other captain. I'm not perfect." but I'm here to leave you. We have a job. He was a leader, but it was also respectful and he was humble. And I was like, that's okay. You're my number two now. So I'm looking forward to the new uh, Pike series, Strange New World. So are we. But Picard so is still we. number one. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, people are really looking forward to Strange New World. Uh, but I did want to ask you, Rod, uh, obviously there's so many answers you could give to this, but if you have any specifics as to something you hope to see in Star Trek in the future, it could already be something that you're already seeing, you know, whether it's more series or whether it's an emphasis on something or whether it's a, a character or an idea that you've always wished they would explore. I can't be specific. Um, I'm meaning my, I don't have a specific, I'm, I'm, I love the question. Right. Um, I can't be specific because I don't have a specific in mind. But I really like the episodes that make you think. You know, um, Black Mirror is a great series. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that one. And unfortunately, there's usually sort of a, not all the time, but a dark ending. You know, it's about technology and how we can abuse technology and how we take for granted AI and what it might be in the future and how we abuse it. And you know, anyhow, um, they just had an episode, well, it was came out a while ago. And it was two men, I don't want to give too much away, Two men who, I, and it's been a while, who meet in virtual reality and different characters, but one's a woman and they fall in love, but they don't know that they're both men. And one of them finds out and, you know, he's really bothered by this. Oh, you're a dude. You know, I can't believe it. We like, we had virtual sex because it's in the future and all that sort of stuff. It, it, it tells this, this, the story of this relationship and how they sort of dealt with that. And that sort of, in the end, love is love. Mm. And I, Listen, Discovery has, has, has two gay characters, and that's fantastic. I mean, I wish we did that back in Next Gen Deep Space Nine. And yes, there were hints of it, but, but I wish they, they tackled it much earlier. I'm glad they're doing it now. I do want episodes that make me think. That make the Star Trek has always been at its best when it's making the viewer consider a different point of view. Mm -hmm. And I would say in recent Star Treks, that isn't happening as much where I'm going, huh, I actually never thought of it that way. But now I'm going to consider that point of view because it's 100% valid. And we are in such a, a divisive time right now where all of us, I'm not saying I'm better than anyone, are very reactionary, right? We, you know, our, our, our leader says something that seems completely ridiculous. And I just want to shake my fist and say, he's a fool, he's an idiot. Even if I feel that way, He's still a human being, and it's worth me taking the time to try to understand it, even if I still disagree with it. 
but I'm doing what everyone else is doing. And I'm saying that freaking moron, I can't believe he's doing this. <laughs> I just, I, we all need to sort of, I don't know. It's, it's so hippy dippy, but be more empathetic and have more unconditional love and understanding and then make an informed decision. You know, I'm really glad that you brought up that, uh, that episode, um, the black mirror episode, because that is yeah. in my mind, I did see that and that was the best episode. It was like immediately good from the first yeah. minute to the last minute. It's just this perfect episode and it has such an interesting take and it does make you think, yeah. Uh, like you mentioned, uh, really glad you brought that up, Sirak. I don't know if you've seen Black Mirror or that episode, but it's perfect. No, I haven't seen it, but I but I can attest to what Rod's talking about, which is when you take a concept that we're already opinionated on and we already have made up our mind that this is wrong yeah. or this is right, and then you change the context and you take it out and put it in somewhere else and some other kind of form and you mm -hmm. put it in the future or you make it about aliens instead of a race and you and you yeah. take the exact same thing that you believe in and see it in a different way and you're like I don't believe in that and that, that's when you <laughs> that's when you question that's when you start to question your own belief system yeah. and, and how you think and you know am I right to be looking at people like this am I right to be treating people like this um and and that's what Star Trek and sci-fi does so well is, is taking things out of context I'm making you think of the, the the current event issues that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let let that be your last battlefield, man. That that's that still, even though it's cliche, it still rings true. That was the original series episode that had the the white face and the black face. Right. So one character mm -hmm. had black on one side and white on the other, and the other character had white on that side and black on the other, and they fought years of wars because they looked different. And we all know what this means, but as you just said, Sirac. They make it something for that you can digest that's palatable, and then you can mm -hmm. reflect on your own prejudice and be like, "Well, that is the dumbest thing I've ever seen, but hold on, <laughs> have I ever done something like that? Have I ever looked at someone and judged them because of the way they looked? That is when Star Trek is at its best. You're a hundred percent right. Um, and it sucks that we're fifty five four fifty four years later, and this is still an issue because of I list skin color. I mean, there's many issues, but I, it's, it's skin color. It's a pigment. <laughs> what, what do you, I don't even get it. I really don't get it. Uh, anyhow. I, and I know people were brought up with certain things and just aren't used to the different things that might be in the world. That's, I feel like it's kind of maybe not their fault. It's, our fault as a society for not providing the opportunity for people to have broader experiences. Right. Well, it's Star Trek's fault that things are improving though. That we can all, <laughs> we can all agree that Star Trek has done their part. Okay? Yes, absolutely. And uh, that's why I'm proud of it. Of we course. do only have just a minute left before we have to run. Um, but uh, Sorok and I have mentioned a lot of times what we're just discussing, which is that that's, pretty much what Star Trek does best and better than any other show is the, uh, you know, the illusions uh, from, you know, uh, the metaphors of, well, those guys suck. I can't believe they're doing those things. And then you stop and go, wait a second, do I do that? You know, like, yeah, they do just such a great job of, of giving people introspection. Yeah. Um, because it's like you said, more palatable through an alien watching on an alien or an alien planet or, or whatever it is, but I think that is possibly above all the the genius that is Star Trek. I think. Yeah. Well, you guys have been. Uh, very uh, I have one last question. Please. One last question. I I I, I want to make sure I get this in. Uh, I don't think you envisioned yourself being at this point right now. You know, having your name on the shows and 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 producing all these new shows. Back then, when I first met you in, um, you know, uh, in the Paramount lot, are you okay with, and would you be all right with, now that you have a seven-year-old, your seven-year-old growing up and, 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 and stepping into the same shoes that you've stepped in for you, your father? I, I, I mean, absolutely. whatever my kid wants to do, as long as he's passionate, if he wants to study ballet, I am 100% behind it. Whatever it is, he just has to be passionate. If mm -hmm. he wants to make 
cutlery for the rest of his life. I want him to make the best damn cutlery out there and love what he's doing. Um, so sure, if he wants to be in the movie making business, I want to make sure he gets every experience and sees it from every angle and and can decide what part of it he wants to be in and how he wants to play that part. Um, yes, I have no problem with with that. Will I ever push him into the industry? No. Um, I'll show him what I do, and mm. and if he gets curious, I'll. I'll let him. I'll have him take a class of something, and and just keep trying to figure out what he loves. Yeah, you know, I uh, one of my greatest little uh, wishes was that I had the chance to meet your father. I I met your mother, who was a wonderful woman and showed me nothing but love every time I was around her, and lit yeah. up the stage when she was uh, on the stage. She was a very energetic, like a radiant person. Um, yeah. but, but I wish that I had the chance to meet your father because obviously, uh, you know, I was a part of what he created and, uh, I wanted to extend my thank you to him, but I'm going to do that to you now, uh, so that you can pass the word on. Thanks. Thank you for everything that you've done for all of us so that we have this platform, this opportunity to talk about these, these topics and, and, and expand our own collective consciousness and make ourselves you know, work towards a better vision of what we can be. Yeah, well, I, um, I, I will gladly pass that on. I know that if my father had met you, he would have loved you. Um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know him. An, a, a young actor on stage uh, or on the production stage, uh, I, I think he had a lot of respect and admiration for someone who's, who's giving it their all. And coming into not just the entertainment industry, but you're coming into your formative years. So I think he understood how difficult that was for someone. And listen, I don't know your life, your situation, but listen, you said it. You, you were a, a kid actor. You were, you were being schooled on the set, which doesn't help you with life. I mean, you, you, you got your arithmetic and, and science and all that then, but then you had to interact with other kids your age, which you in your own words was could be challenging at times. So I, I think he had a lot of respect and admiration for, for someone who chose to do that. Um, so I, gladly I'll, I'll pass it on. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And thank you for having me on the show guys. Rod. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. We know you've got a, you're always all over the place. You're working on things or you're having fun. You're living your life and we appreciate you taken some time and uh, the dog's time whose name i forgot yes. nuke we got nuke, nuke back there where is he <laughs> there he is hi nuke oh he's so good he's chilling there's nuke yep <laughs> uh but yeah but thank you so much for for taking the time to talk with us we really appreciate you we appreciate what you do we appreciate what you stand for and what you say um so thank you yeah and i take it there's going to be people watching and listening to this so at the virtual trek con you. yeah well, hey, everyone. Yeah. I hope you're having a great con. I, 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 I wish, well, maybe I can be there to join you. Well, I guess I am there through this <laughs> joining you. Yes, yes, you are. But, but I can attend and maybe I can sit down and watch the show that you're watching now, which would be weird because that'd be me. But You whatever. can and you can be part of the, uh, the live chat as it goes as well. Perfect. Um, and I'll, then I'll on make jokes about this, the guy in the yeah. green shirt. And then on top of that, <laughs> we'll see you at the next in-person convention and it will be the glorious thing ever it, it certainly will it certainly will and, and i appreciate that we had good rod conversation guys thank you sorry i just wanted to remind everybody about roddenberry.com and the great work that you do there the merchandise awesome stuff so everybody <laughs> should you. check that out as well thank you right thanks very much uh rod we'll see you next time and everybody else at home thank you all very much and we'll see you next time <laughs>